it's, it's 1031. Facebook is on. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. good to see you all here on this cold November morning. I heard it's snowing up in New York. Yeah, I heard that. I heard that. Boy, I'm glad we're not in New York. Me too. Anyway, good morning. Let's ask God's blessing, and we're going to get started today. Eternal God, we ask you to bless this service. Bless each one who's here, each one who's watching over Facebook and YouTube. Bless us now and inspire, please, the message in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, we know that Thanksgiving is coming up in a, in a few days. And no, I'm not going to give you a message on Thanksgiving like you thought I would. Uh, you know, every church this weekend, every church is going to be talking about Thanksgiving, and that's fine. It's just that you expected it, so I decided not to do it. But I'll tell you one thing. There is something. I'm not going to give a, a message on the Thanksgiving holiday, but there is something that we should be thankful for, and I'm going to be talking about that today. Before I get into that, though, I want to make a few announcements. Uh, I want you to prepare now to come up with some questions for a future service. Uh, any Bible questions you may have, if I don't know the answer, well, we'll find out the answers together. So begin emailing them now to me, and the email I want you to send them to is CFMCOG, CFM as in Christian Fellowship Ministries, COG, CFMCOG at AOL.com. So email me your, your questions, Bible questions. Uh, don't ask me which is better, a Ford or a Chevrolet, because I don't know. But Bible questions. So when I get a good number of them, we'll have a question and answer service to get the Bible answers. And I want all of you to, to participate if you can. All of us have questions. And so now we did this, what, six months ago maybe, or, and it, it turned out to be very, very good. People enjoyed it. Where we just had a, I just went through a series of questions and what, and what the Bible said. So whatever question you might have, write them down. And once we get at least probably 20 questions, we'll have a service. So that may be in a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, okay? Uh, now, I want to get into the message today. Jesus tells us to be perfect. He does. Now, some people say that word perfect doesn't mean perfect. It means fully developed in spiritual maturity. Well, are you there yet? If it, it if it comes to spiritual maturity, you are as far as you can go. You are as perfect as you can be. No, it, 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 actually, I'm going to prove it to you in a few moments. The word really does mean perfect. No matter what people may tell you, it means. Now, I want to uh, go to Ezekiel 14 today, and you may want to go with me to this, some of these scriptures. Or you may want to jot them down and make a good Bible study for this afternoon. But Ezekiel chapter 14, listen to this. Because you know you hear people say, well, it's impossible to be perfect. Therefore, Jesus didn't mean that. Yes, he did. He absolutely meant it. Be perfect. Yeah, but he knows we can't be. I've heard people say that. Now, listen to this. Ezekiel 14, verse 14. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll go all you back up to verse 12. The word of the Lord came to me. And he said, Son of man, talking to Ezekiel, when the land sins against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it and will break the staff of, of the bread thereof. Our grocery prices are already going up and increasing. And uh, do you know a lot of our fa farmland is now owned by China? And if we make China mad, they could withhold food from us. Now, we're actually looking at the possibility of a food crisis in the next 12 months. A serious food crisis. So if if they tra if, if a nation trespasses against God, then I'll stretch out my hand upon it and will break the staff of the bread thereof, of it, and will send famine upon it and cut off man and beast. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, says the Lord God. So even though we could say, oh, but wait a minute, Lord, you don't want to do that to America. Well, look at all these righteous men we've got. Now, I don't know who you'd point to. Why, well, look, here's Billy Graham. No, he's passed away. Well, let's see, who else is left? Uh, uh, John Hagee. Uh, look at all these great men we have in America. Surely you won't punish our country. And God says even, even if Noah and Daniel and Job were living in your country, I'm still going to punish the country. Think about this. When Daniel was alive in the nation of Judah, 
And it went into captivity. Didn't Daniel go into captivity too? Yeah. And he was a righteous man. When you look at the book of Daniel, or when you read anything about him, can you find anything in the Bible that says Daniel committed any sins that you can think of? Now, if I ask you about David, you say, oh, yeah. But what about Daniel? Can you think of one thing Daniel did that was ever wrong? I'm not saying he was sinless. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, could you lay any blame on Daniel? No. And Jesus calls Daniel in Matthew 24 and also in Mark 13, Daniel the prophet. In Matthew 24, he calls him Daniel the prophet. You never read anything wrong about him. He was a good man. So, and yet, Daniel himself, when he was living there in Judah, and it went into captivity, when the Babylonians came there and took them into captivity, he went along with them. Now, you've heard people say, i got good news and bad news for you. Well, here's the bad news. If God allows our enemies to overtake us because of the sins of this nation, and you are righteous, and you are a Christian, and you're like Daniel, just like Daniel had to go into captivity, so will you. You say, but wait a minute, I thought if we were Philadelphian Christians that God would protect us from the tribulation. He'll protect you. You have to consider the fact that Daniel went into captivity as a slave, but then God protected him in the captivity. He ended up rising up in the government of Babylon, which is kind of unusual. In fact, he got to be the prime minister after a while. So God will allow you to go into captivity if you're living here in America and when you read Leviticus 26, and if you're a Christian, you don't know what Leviticus 26 says, shame on you. That in Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 68, it talks about if a nation does not obey God, it's going to suffer this problem and this problem and this problem. And then the last plague or the, or the last punishment will be for your enemies to come in and take you over. I heard years ago that Japan was buying up thousands of acres of farmland, and now China is buying up thousands of acres. So, you, you, you know, they used to say back in the 70s, buy American. Well, it might be American here. It might be here in America, but it might be owned by the Japanese or the Chinese. I'm not, I'm not putting Japanese and Chinese people down. I'm saying that, that our nation is becoming more and more vulnerable to those who hate us. China doesn't love America. You know that, right? Why should any of our companies sell thousands and thousands of acres of farmland to the Chinese? So a lot of the food that you're eating when you go to the grocery store, a lot of that was grown on American land, but it's owned by China. So what I'm saying is one day, if this nation does not repent and turn back to being pro-life and not being pro-choice, you know God is pro-choice. Did you know that? In Deuteronomy, God says, I set before you life and death. You choose. Blessings. Yeah, I set before you blessings and I set before you cursings. Choose. So if you choose the curses, you'll get them. If you choose the blessings, you'll get them. But how do you choose blessings? You choose blessings by saying, I'm going to do what God said. How do you choose curses? I'm going to disobey God. He said, choose life. When it comes to things like abortion, choose life. God tells you. I, I'm giving you a choice, but he tells you what the choice should be. Now, you have a choice. The sinner will choose death. And the, and the real Christian will choose life. You know, I talked to a lady some years ago that she thought that she had gotten pregnant. She wasn't married. And she told me, she said, because uh, I, I knew her pretty well. I forget how I met her now. But anyway, she was a Pentecostal lady, and she said she was going to have an abortion. And I talked to her and worked with her for quite some time. And, and I think I talked her out of it. <clears throat> but then she found out she wasn't pregnant, but she really did think she was, and she had already determined she was going to kill the child because she wasn't married. And here she was, a professing Christian, went to church as far as I know every Sunday. And it's such a shame that, that people think, well, it's okay to kill a child if you can't afford to raise it. Well, now, now I'm going to answer this question here. I know I'm digressing from my message here, but I, maybe I should. Does a woman have a right to do what she wants to do with her own body? I say 100%, yes, she does. Do I have a right to do what I want to with my own body? When I'm in my own car that's paid for and I don't know a penny on it, I absolutely have a right to do what I want to with my own body. Can I, 
When I leave here today, when I go out of the parking lot, can I run 100 miles an hour into a brick wall and kill myself? Yes. Do I have the right? Sure, it's my body, and I own the car. Now, I couldn't do that in your car. That'd be wrong. But in my own car, I can do what I want to. But wait a minute. What if I'm carrying a passenger? And what if you are my passenger? And, and we're driving down the road now. See, you know, I think I'm going to commit suicide today. In fact, I think I'll do it right now. There's a brick wall, and I floorboard it, and you're my passenger. Now, wait a minute. I've got a right to do what I want with my own body, but not when you're my passenger, do I? Here's one more thing. A woman has a right to do what she wants to with her own body. The Bible says that when you get married, the husband does not have power over his own body, but the wife. If a wife has power over the husband's body and she has a right to do what she wants to with her own body, if she can kill her own unborn child, why come she can't kill her husband? I think she can. If you can kill a child and he's innocent, why not kill the husband too? Anyway, I know I'm off topic, but I just had to throw that at you. If this nation does not repent, if you want to know the future of the United States of America, it's right there in Leviticus 26, read it yourself. Now, you might say that doesn't apply to America. That applies only to the Jews. Let me, I just thought of the scripture here that I want to read to you. Maybe it's in this Bible. Yeah, here it is. Blessed is every nation whose God is the Lord. That's Psalm 33, 12. Now listen to this verse. But sin is a reproach to any people. That's Proverbs 14, 34. So, what, so those blessings and cursings in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 applies as much to the United States of America as it ever did to ancient Israel or to the nation of Judah. All right, so here's what's going to happen. When God says, when I get ready to punish you, though I'm still in Ezekiel 14, though Daniel and Noah and Job were living in it, you're still going to be punished. Verse 16, though these three men were in it. Obviously, these were very righteous men. As I live, says the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered. In other words, if you are righteous then you could be delivered. You may still go into captivity as Daniel himself did, but God delivered him in the captivity. All right, now, verse 19, <clears throat> if I send a pestilence into that land <clears throat> and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast. Verse 20, though Noah, who was a very righteous man, Daniel and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. So in other words, Job wouldn't be able to deliver his son. Daniel couldn't deliver his son. Noah couldn't. Just because you are the son of a famous righteous preacher, let's say, doesn't mean, doesn't mean a thing. They shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they shall deliver their own souls by their righteousness. God is not looking at how great your parents are, but how, how are you living? Now, what's that got to do with what Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 48? He said, be perfect. And I started out with that scripture. Be perfect. These three men were very, very righteous. I mentioned that you couldn't find anything wrong about Daniel. Let's look at Noah in Noah chapter uh, in Noah in Genesis. There should have been a book named Noah. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, <clears throat> verse uh, 7. <clears throat> The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, <clears throat> and the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for, for it repenteth me that I've made them. God said, they're so wicked, I'm just going to wipe them out. But, verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. You know, Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. He lived through generations and generations, and these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. The word just means righteous and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Verse 11, the earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. Verse 12, behold, it was corrupt. Verse 13, the second line, for the earth is filled with violence. But Noah was a man who was perfect in his generations. People say it's impossible to be perfect. But there again, what does God mean when he talks about perfection? We're going to look at this very thoroughly. 
You know, it was perfect. Now, somebody might say, but didn't Noah uh, get drunk one time? Let me say something in defense of Noah. If you can drink one glass of wine or whatever it might be and not get drunk, but you can't drink two, you know where your limit is. Now, you live at Myrtle Beach, and that's sea level, and there's 14.7 pounds per square inch of air pressure at the beach. Now you travel to Colorado, and you're in Denver, and you're at 14,000 feet. Half a glass might make you drunk. The air pressure will determine that. Believe it or not, you can, if you have a lot of air pressure, you can drink a lot more than when you don't. Now, before the flood, the air pressure was so strong that uh, and they've actually done experiments right down on this street. Right down here, there's a place. It's a hyperbaric chamber, and wounds heal up faster. They, they, hyperbaric means they, there's a lot of air pressure added. And, I mean, they just, they make it very, very, it's, uh, they put so much air in there that if you've got a wound or whatever, it'll heal up. You, get, you feel better. You feel full of energy. You could drink several glasses of beer if you were in there and you wouldn't get drunk. What happened after the flood, when that canopy come crashing down, the air pressure changed. Noah had his regular two or three drinks, and this time it made him drunk as a skunk. Plus, the ark was in the top of the mountain, so the air pressure was so low. So it's not that Noah was an alcoholic. He wasn't an alcoholic. He was a man who was perfect in his generations. But even a man who's perfect might forget that He's at a different altitude. <laughs> he might get drunk by accident. Any questions? <laughs> but what I'm saying is you, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. Noah had never lived in that kind of a, an environment before. So Noah was perfect. Now, I want to uh, go to the book of Job. He mentions these three men. So I'll, I want to go to the book of Job now. If you can't find Job, go to Psalms and then back up. One book. If I say go to Esther, and it's the next book over, you say, where's Esther? But everybody can find Psalms. So if you can find Psalms, back up one book. And chapter 1 of Job, verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect. Now, scholars believe that Moses possibly wrote the book of Job. We don't know for sure. But is it Scripture? Do you know the Apostle Paul quotes out of the book of Job and he says it is written, that, that meant it was inspired. In 1 Corinthians 3, it is written and he quotes out of the book of Job. And in James chapter 5, also James, the brother of Jesus, refers to Job as a real person. And so the fact that they mention this and Paul quotes it as scripture shows, yeah, this is inspired. So God inspired verse 1 to be written. There was a man who was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed, that means shunned, evil. Job chapter 2, verse, uh, well, wait a minute. Go back to Job 1, verse 8. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and shews evil. The devil said, oh, well, take, you know, you got a hedge of protection. Take that away and see what he does. And Job remained a righteous man. Chapter 2 and verse 3, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a perfect man. Now, when God calls you perfect and God can't lie, you are a perfect and an upright person, one that fears God and shews evil. And still, God said he holds fast his integrity, although you, the devil, moved me against him to destroy him without cause. So God took responsibility for it. You say, well, was he really perfect? God does look at the heart, doesn't he? You know, David, I'm not going to ask you to tell me what David did wrong, but you know David did some things wrong. But the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. And God's heart is perfect, isn't it? Just something to think about. I want to go to the New Testament now. Uh, oh, by the way, let me go back to Genesis before I do this one last time. I forgot to do this. Uh, Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham, he was 99 years old and the Lord appeared to him. <coughs> and God said, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect 
People say God wouldn't ask us to do something he knows we can't do. Why did God tell Abraham to be perfect? You say, what's this got to do with being thankful? I'll, I'm getting to that. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect. Well, Job was, Noah was, here's Abraham, God telling him to be. Now, was Abraham actually perfect, though? Didn't he kind of prevaricate the truth just a wee bit with the king when he said, uh, she's my uh, <clears throat> sister? Well, yeah, but he left out a very important point, and that was the fact that she was also his wife. He failed to mention that, which might have been important. So you and I may not think he was perfect, but God told him to be perfect, which meant that he could have been. Now I want to go to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 13. Are there any questions now from the Old Testament before we move on? Do you have any questions online? So far, I've put them all to sleep, I guess. You know that, you know, some people say they've been called to preach. I'll tell you how you can tell if you've been called to preach if people go to sleep when you're preaching. You know you've been called to preach. Just a quick while you're flipping pages and yeah. we'll upload the YouTube upload this sermon to YouTube later since we're not live on YouTube today, but due to technical difficulties. Yeah, we'll upload this to YouTube later since we have some technical difficulties, so we'll upload it from Facebook to YouTube. All right, now in, in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 9, we are glad when we are weak and you're strong. Even though we're weak, we're still happy when you're strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. That's interesting. We want you to be perfect, he told these Gentile Christians. Can you be perfect? You say, this is a crazy question you're asking. Nobody can be perfect. Well, why then did God tell Abraham, go and be perfect? Why did Jesus say to you in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect? We're going to look at that today. 2 Corinthians 13, 9, I'm wishing your perfection. Ephesians 4, 13 says, well, let me start in uh, verse 11. God gave gifts to the church things that would be a blessing to the church. He gave various ministry offices, ministerial offices, apostles all the way down through teachers, and these are a blessing to the church. They're a gift to the church. Why did he give these gifts to the church, these ministry gifts? Verse 14, to perfect the saints and for the work of the ministry, to edify, that Greek word means to build up or to charge the body of Christ. Now, how long are these ministry gifts going to last? Some people say that apostles, that was all done away and there are no prophets today, etc. No, God gave these ministry gifts to the church till we all come in the unity of the faith. Are we there? We're not there yet, so there are these ministry gifts still exist. Till we all come, number one, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. We are, God wants us to come into the knowledge of the Son of God, listen, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Would you like to be a perfect man or woman? Get to know Jesus, the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Get to know him really well. Ladies, if you want to be a good wife, get to know your husband. Husbands, if you want to be a good husband, really, really, really get to know your wife. There are men who don't even know their wedding anniversaries. Not here, of course, in this room. But, but, you know, get to know your wife. And if you want to be a perfect Christian, one of the things you're supposed to do, what is the wife called in the, uh, what is the church called in the Bible? She's a, like a bride to Christ, and Christ is the bridegroom. So just like a wife should get to know everything there is to know about her husband, the church needs to get to really come to know Jesus. God gave these ministry gifts to help us, apostles and evangelists and so on, to perfect the saints till we all come in a perfect knowledge, a perfect knowledge on, uh, of, the, of the Son of God unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's where we're supposed to be. All right. Now I want to go to Philippians chapter 3. Another Gentile church. Chapter 3 and verse 3. We, the Jews, 
are the circumcision, and that was a kind of a symbolic name for them, who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. We have no confidence in the flesh, he's saying here. Then he said, <clears throat> verse four, verses four through six, he talks about how, but if, if you could have confidence in the flesh, man, look at all these degrees I've got. Look at all the knowledge I've got. Plus, I'm an Israelite, and I'm a, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, man. Concerning zeal, verse 6, to prove he had zeal, he was persecuting the church. Now, listen to the last part, verse 6. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, he did not say he was sinless. But you couldn't point to Paul and say, Paul, you're not fasting on the Day of Atonement. When it came to the law, he did it perfectly. Paul, you're not putting the leavening out of your house. When it comes to the law, he did it perfectly. You're putting the leavening out of your house. Okay, perfect. You're resting on the Sabbath day. You couldn't point a finger at Paul and say, Paul, you're not keeping that law or this law. If Paul had been a farmer, he would have allowed his land to rest every seventh year. Now, I doubt he owned a farm. I doubt he was a farmer, but he would have done it. If he had an income, he would have tithed it. Whatever the law said, Paul said, when it comes to the law, I'm blameless. You can't point a finger at me and show one thing where I've done wrong when it comes to the law. Let me ask you something. Did Paul say the law was done away? Good grief. That's ridiculous. No, it wasn't done away. All right. So Jesus tells us to be perfect. We see that Noah, Daniel, and Job were righteous men. Job was called perfect. And here, and then in Corinthians, he says, I want your perfection. Here in uh, Philippians, he says that he was perfect in the law. Look at verse 9. I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of or from God by faith. That's the best kind of righteousness to have. Verse 12, not as though I had already attained. Now, in America, we say, I haven't yet arrived. That's modern 21st century terminology. I have, well, I haven't arrived, but I'm on my way. Paul said, I haven't attained. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after. After what? Perfection. I follow after perfection. That if that I may apprehend that for which I'm also apprehended of Christ. Christ has apprehended me to make me perfect, and that's what I'm following after. Brethren, verse 13, I count not myself to have apprehended. I have not yet arrived, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Okay, so I've made some mistakes. But I'm going to forget about that and reaching forth to those things which are before. I press toward the mark. What is the mark? Jesus said, be perfect. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. You want to be perfect? Be thus minded. Thus means in this manner. If you want to be perfect, you need to press toward the mark of being blameless in the law. Keeping God's law. Keeping his commandments and statutes and judgments. And do it consistently. That's the mark. And there's a high calling there. You'll get a great reward for it. Are there any questions? Now, again, when it comes to salvation, we're not under any law, commandments, statutes, judgments, do's, don'ts. We're not under any of the commandments. We're under grace and grace 100%. Thank God. But once you are once you are saved by grace, is it okay now to go out and rob banks and do all those terrible things? No. Then... God gives you the Holy Spirit to give you the power. Acts 1a calls the Holy Spirit the power of God. You now have the power to live a righteous life. You pick up the Ten Commandments, the Holy Spirit gives you understanding, which you couldn't have before. You know, Einstein was a genius and he didn't understand the Bible. You have to have the Holy Spirit to help you understand the Bible. That's 2 Peter 1.21. You have to have the Holy Spirit to understand the Scriptures. And Einstein, bless his heart, I'm not putting him down. I'm glad he was a great astrophysicist, but he couldn't understand this book because it takes the Spirit of God to understand it. Now, you and I don't understand the math behind Einstein's theory of relativity. Duh, we're not too smart, but we can understand something that he couldn't because we have the Holy Spirit. So as many as be thus minded, you need to also press toward that mark of perfection. Any questions? Now I want to go to uh, the next book, Colossians 
chapter 1, verse 28. Well, back up to verse 27, the last line. Christ in you is the hope of glory, whom we preach, verse 28, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And people say, what? What do you mean perfect? It's in the Bible, folks. I want to present you perfect. Now, does that mean that Paul succeeded, that everybody in the Colossian church was perfect? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that was his goal. When God told Abraham in Genesis 17, 1, walk before me and be thou perfect, does that mean Abraham suddenly right away, bingo, he's now perfect? No, but that's where he started walking. Pa Paul said, I haven't yet attained, but I'm pressing toward that mark. Yes, sir. Well, if we were to attain perfection, then we would not need repentance. Yeah, it's true. You wouldn't need to. Once, once you do repent and now you're perfect, you wouldn't need to repent again. That's true. You'd never have to confess any sins because you wouldn't have any. So, Paul said, I want your perfection. I want to go to 2 Timothy, several books over. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 17. I know I'm giving you a lot of scriptures today, but that way you're hearing from God and not... I don't like to go to a church where I hear a minister stand up and say, well, in my opinion, blah, 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 or I heard it said, or it's been said, or when I went to seminary, they told me. No, what does the Bible say? I want to hear from God. 2 Timothy 3, 17. So I give you more scriptures than, than you'll hear in most churches. Let's start in verse uh, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is profitable for doctrine. So Exodus 20 is profitable for doctrine. The Ten Commandments are profitable for doctrine. For reproof, that word basically means rebuke, if you need to be rebuked. For correction, all Scripture is profitable for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect. If you want to be perfect, you start Genesis and you read through this whole Bible and then go back and study what you read and then go back and read what you studied then go back and study what you read. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a work man, and there's work involved, that needs not to be ashamed, <laughs> rightly dividing the word of truth. A lot of these people, when they stand before Christ, and he'll ask a lot of these TV preachers, why did you preach such and such? And they're going to be ashamed, because it's not in the Bible. They know it's not in the Bible, but it's popular, and they'll preach it. The, all scriptures inspired by God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God, and the word man in Greek means person, male or female, may be perfect. Now, here's how you can be perfect. Thoroughly, the modern word is pronounced thoroughly, furnished unto all good works. So how do you get to be perfect? You need to obey all good works. Now, Galatians talks about the works of the law. Oh, we're not saved by the works of the law. That's true. But once you're saved by grace, then you're supposed to do good works. In Ephesians 2, 8, it says, By grace are you saved, not of yourself, it is, but you're saved by faith, through faith. And then verse 10 says, Because we're saved unto good works. We're not saved because of good works. We're saved to do good works. Does that make sense? And yet the vast majority of the churches in the world don't understand that. I want to go to Hebrews chapter 6. And verse 1. Well, let me back up a few verses in chapter 5. Verse 12. The time has come when you ought to be teachers. But you need one to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. Oracles means divine words. You got to go back and get the ABCs. That's a shame. Verse 14, but strong meat belongs to them that are full age. So are you mature in your spiritual walk? Now, chapter 6, verse 1, therefore leaving, that does not mean forsaking, but leaving the principles, the fundamentals of the doctrine of Christ. Let's go on unto what? Perfection. Not laying again, constantly going back to the basic ABCs, basic fundamentals, repentance from dead works and so on. That's all good, but don't just stay on that. Doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead and so on. 
He said, let's leave these basic fundamental principles. We know them. We know them through and through. Now let's go on unto perfection. Have you got there yet? Have you reached perfection? But that's the goal. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Now in chapter 13, you say, man, you give us a lot of scriptures. Well, you're hearing from God. This is God talking to you today. In chapter 13, verse 20, and 21, now the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, may the God of peace do what? Verse 21, make you perfect. How? In every good work. No, we're not saved by works. Galatians 5 proves that. But, but God wants us to be perfect in good works. Loving your neighbor. Honoring God, obeying his Ten Commandments, his statutes, his judgments, doing everything God has told you to do. May God make you perfect, verse 21, in every good work to do his will. Now, his will is his word. We've talked about that over and over and over. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And how does that happen? It happens through Jesus Christ. He's there. He's in you through his spirit. To whom be glory forever and ever, he said. Now, are there any questions so far? The next book over is James. James 3. Verse 1, don't rush out to be teachers now. Don't be many masters, the Greek word means teacher, knowing we're going to receive the greater. And the, the King James says condemnation. I hope I don't get condemned for teaching the Bible. The Greek word is judgment. We get judged more severely than the ones who listen. All right, now verse 3 uh, let, well, I'll go, go and read verse 2 here. For in many things we offend all. We Christians, we do offend. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. Here's another way you can be perfect. Don't offend in, in how you talk. And you're able to bridle the whole body. Bridle means you discipline it. So you're perfect in your works. You're, you're shooting for the mark of the, the high prize of that, of that calling in Christ. Here now, you're perfect in your words. Now, Jesus said, if a person believes what he says, and he speaks it out, if he believes in his heart, and he has no doubt he'll have whatever he says. So we need to, to start acting the way Jesus did. Do you want to be perfect? He said, you need to bridle your whole body through your words. You put bits in the horse's mouth, and you and just one little bit in the horse's mouth, and you can take that great big horse and steer him to the right or to the left or make him go or make him stop. And the same thing is true. We can even control our health through what we say. People say, I'm going to die young, and they do. You've heard me tell this in the faith and healing class. Elvis Presley said when he was a young man, he said, my mother died when she was 42, and so will I. And then he got to be 42, and his body prepared itself to fulfill that prophecy. He believed it with all his heart. He spoke it with his mouth at age 42. That's too young to die. He's fell over dead. Lyndon Johnson said, my father died at 63, and I will too. And he'd been saying that all those years. When he got to 63, he died. Mark Twain said, I was born when Halley's Comet came in, and I'll go out with Halley's Comet. I'll die. And in 1910, Halley's Comet came through, and Mark Twain fell over dead. What I'm saying is, be careful what you say because it affects even your body. What's the question? It goes back to any person. Okay. Yeah. Any idea how God chooses you over someone else? I have friends that go to church, but they still keep Christmas and Easter. They go to Protestant churches like Methodist and Baptist. And <clears throat> <clears throat> yes. I do have an idea on that. The kingdom of God, or any kingdom, any government, is like a pyramid. The lowest offices, there are many, many, many of them, but as you go up in the pyramid, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The higher up you go in the kingdom, the smaller number, the lesser number of offices, until you get to the very, very top of the pyramid, and there's only one person there, and that's Jesus. He's the king of all kings. 
And so under Jesus, you have probably Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then you have Moses, you have Elijah, and as you keep going down, you come to men like King David, who's over all the 12 tribes, and under David, you have the 12 apostles, who's a king over each tribe, that's Matthew 19, and so it's like a pyramid. So there are fine Christians in many churches, but God is not calling every Christian to the highest office. I mean, what if God called every Christian to rule over the tribes of Israel? What would you do with the apostles? I mean, there, there can only be one man over each tribe. You see? And so you can't, none of you in this room will be king over the tribe of uh, Judah. That's already been taken. None of you will be king over the tribe of Manasseh or Ephraim. That's already been taken. And none of you will be king over all the 12 tribes because that office is already taken. David's got that, according to Ezekiel 34. So to answer that question, God is calling. Now, the question is, why would he call you to a high office? And here's a fine Christian over here, and they haven't understood the truths you've understood. They're not being called to the same office that you are. If, if God has opened up your mind and heart to understand that you're supposed to obey his law, Jesus said the ones who are the greatest in the kingdom are those who do two things. Number one, they obey even the least of his commandments. And number two, they teach men so. And yet, the, the Sunday churches say, well, now the fourth commandment's been abolished. That's been done away. And not that they're not Christians. And I'm not saying who's saved and who's not saved. I'm just going to assume, okay, a lot of those people are saved. But when Christ returns and they get a glorified body, they won't have the same reward you'll get. Because they're not keeping the law and they're not tithing to support those who do teach the law. They're actually tithing to support those who say the law has been done away and abolished. And I'll say, bless their hearts, they just don't know any better. God has not opened up the hearts and minds of everybody to understand this, but it's so simple. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Obey even the least of the commandments and teach men so, and you'll be called greatest in the kingdom. Now, you'll be in the category of the greatest. You won't be the greatest. Jesus is the greatest. And let me ask you this. Why is Jesus the greatest? He never broke a single commandment, did he? So you can't be greater than him. <laughs> so the more of God's law you keep, and Jesus taught it. He said, don't think I've come to destroy the law. He himself came to fulfill, to obey the law. So he's going to be right at the very top. Uh, all right. I'm going to go to uh, 2 Peter 3, 18. Grow in grace and you want to be a perfect man? And in the knowledge, we just read that Philippians. Grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't just listen to radio preachers and television preachers. Grow in the knowledge of Christ. Now, just how perfect are we supposed to be? I'm, I didn't actually turn to Matthew 5.48, did I? I'm going to now. I'm going to read to you exactly what Jesus said. I deliberately saved it to last. Matthew 5 and verse 48. Therefore, therefore means because of what was just said. Verse 44, even love your enemies, dear me. Therefore, here's what I'm telling you to do. I want you to be perfect. Now, before I read the rest of that verse, I've got a reference Bible. And, and at the bottom of the page, my reference, the note at the bottom of the page says, the word perfect implies full development, growth into maturity of godliness. It does not imply sinless perfection. Whoa, 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 whoa. Is that footnote correct? Let me go back and read all of verse 48. Be you therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, if the word perfect means growth into maturity of godliness, if you could ever have that kind of spiritual maturity as God Almighty has, give me a better definition of perfection than that. Perfection, is the most ultimate perfect being in the entire universe is God Almighty. Jesus said, I want you to be exactly like God. If that's not perfection, what is it? So you might say, but wait a minute. Why would Christ tell us to do that? No, he knows that we're made out of flesh. He knows we're, we're all these problems we have. You know, one of my heroes, 
uh, of the founding fathers was Benjamin Franklin. And I've read his autobiography, I don't know how many times. And he made this statement. I doubt he came up with it. He probably heard it from somebody else when he was growing up. And all of us have heard this paraphrased. Shoot for the stars. We've all heard that. Benjamin Franklin said that. And this is what he said. If you shoot for the stars, you may not end up that high. But if you shoot that high, you will end up a lot higher up than if you hadn't tried. I'm paraphrasing it. I can't remember his exact words. But shoot for the stars and you'll end up higher up. When I was having trouble in grade school with math, I told my mother, because I was bringing home, you know, D's and <clears throat> whatever below is a D, I wasn't doing so hot in math. And I told my mother, well, I'm shooting for a C. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm determined I'm going to get a C next report card. She said, no, shoot for an A, and then you'll get the C. If you shoot for a C, you're still going to get an F. So you shoot for the top. Now, Jesus didn't say... God told Abraham to be perfect. I want you to be like Abraham. Because Abraham wasn't quite the right example, was he? David was man after God's own heart, but Jesus didn't say, I want you to be like David. Because David didn't have it quite right. He said, in fact, here's another interesting thing. Did Jesus say, I want you to be like Peter over here? Peter's such a wonderful man. He's an apostle. No. Now, here's one more thing. Did Jesus say, be as perfect as me? Because, you see, he had temptations. He didn't yield to them. But he had to fight the flesh. He had temptations like we have. He said, listen, here's how perfect I want you to be. I want you to be as perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Folks, that is ultimate perfection. And then my note here at the bottom of the page says it doesn't mean sinless perfection. Is God a sinner? God is sinlessly perfect. And that's how Jesus wants you to be. Well, what if I don't make it? What if I live out my three score and ten and I haven't made it? Just keep what Paul say. I haven't yet attained, but I'm working at it. I'm I'm walking toward the prize. I'm walking in that direction. What did Paul say in uh, Romans uh, eight verse one? You're under no condemnation if you're not walking after the flesh, but if you're walking after the Spirit, there's no condemnation on. Now, when you're walking, you may fall down. In Proverbs 24, it says a just man falls over and over and over. Well, wait a minute. When I first read that, I said, how can he be just? The word means righteous. If he keeps falling and falling, how can he be just? Because you can't fall unless you keep getting up. You can fall one time, and if you stay on the ground, that's it. But it says in Proverbs 24, a just man falls seven times and rises up again. In other words... We say he can't be righteous because he keeps falling. God says, yes, he is because he keeps getting up. As long as you keep getting up and as long as you keep walking after the Holy Spirit, God says, you're just. The devil says, no, he's not. He failed seven times. Seven is, is a symbolic number of completeness. In other words, from the time you're a kid to the time you die at age 90 or 95 or 100, you may fall like the number seven, a complete number of times. But if you keep getting up, God says, you're righteous. You see that? If you keep getting up, you're righteous. So Jesus really did mean what he said. Now, see, we have some kids here today. When, when, a, when a child goes out and plays and gets dirty playing with the dog or the cat, and you know how little kids are. I used to do this, roll around the grass, and you just get really dirty. And you come in, my mother would say, oh, you're dirty. And she'd take a washcloth and wash me clean. She wouldn't let me go to bed dirty. When you are dirty, do you go to the grocery store or the, the drugstore and get a, a medicine that's a pill that's called a clean pill? And if you take that pill, it makes you clean. How do you get clean when you're dirty? Do you, do you take a, some kind of a special pill that makes you clean? No. The way you get rid of the dirt is you wash, you get in the shower, and you cleanse the dirt away. And what is left is clean. When you get rid of all the dirt, you're clean. How does God make you righteous? He forgives you of all of your sin, and he forgets it. And what's left is a righteous man or woman. In Luke 18, the publican, and Jesus is talking about just an average type publican. They were cheats, liars, and thieves. And the publican wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. He was so ashamed of his sin. And he said, oh, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. And he asked for mercy. 
Jesus made an astonishing statement. He said that man went down to his house justified. The Greek word means made righteous. Well, what did he do that made him righteous? He just asked for mercy. And when God gave him mercy and forgave his sins, there was no sin on him. It's like if you get really dirty and I've changed oil in the car and you, you know, you get, you climb under the car and you get all greasy and dirty. What's the first thing you do? You come in the house, you take a shower. When you remove the dirt, what's left is clean. <clears throat> when God forgives you of your sin, what's left is righteousness. Any questions on that or comments on that? I want to go to Romans. Uh, I want to conclude with Romans. And I'm going to go to chapter 3. Romans, uh, well, Romans uh, 3. We all know the scripture in verse 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that. But verse 20, by the deeds, the Greek word there is works. By the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Because we all slip up, verse 23, because we've all sinned. That's why we can't be justified by the works of the law, because we've all transgressed the law. But now, verse 24, we're justified freely. Greek word justified means made righteous freely by his grace. Through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that means a favor, through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness, not mine, his, for the remission, the removal of sins that are past. Verse 26, to declare not your righteousness, his, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. He will justify you if you believe in Jesus. So where is boasting then? By what law of works? No, law of faith. Verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is made righteous by faith without the deeds or the works of the law. The Greek word there is works. Without the works of the law, you can be made righteous. But now does that mean we don't obey the law? Verse 31, do we then make void the law? The Greek word there means abolish. Do, do we then abolish the law? God forbid. He said, yea, we establish the law. The law is established. It is not done away maybe I should read one more verse before I conclude chapter 5 and verse 1 therefore being justified Greek word means made righteous by faith we have peace with God as long as you have to obey a certain percentage of the commandments to go along with the grace of God what if you miss it by one commandment you're, you're lost forever let me tell you salvation is 100% grace let me give you this one illustration and I will conclude. People go to the circus and they buy tickets and they pay good money to see these trapeze artists. And the way these trapeze artists works, you'll have two men on a trapeze and they're, they're doing like this, back and forth. And finally, this guy over here will let go and do a somersault and time it just right to catch that man's hands. And then the two of them go together. You've seen that done on television. Maybe you've been to the circus and you've seen that. One of the, the, the men on the trapeze will let go and turn around like this, do a somersault, just to catch the other man's hands at just the right time. The timing has to be perfect. People don't pay tickets to see them fall. They pay, they pay tickets to see the great skill these men have in doing that. And they do that same trick over and over and over and over. But do you know what's below them on the ground down there? A safety net. Why is the safety net there? These guys are professionals. Just in case. Jesus said, be perfect. But there's a safety net. And it's called grace. And just in case, you're not supposed to break the law. But just in case you do, there's a safety net called grace. People give thanks at the Thanksgiving holiday for all sorts of things but don't forget to give thanks to God for his grace because you wouldn't make it without it. We won't make it without it. Do the law, yes. Try to be perfect, yes. But isn't it wonderful that if you slip up in the next 12 months and all of you when you walk out here today, you say, I will be perfect. Great. 
But just in case you slip up, by accident, there's a safety net to catch you, and it's called grace of God. That's one of the greatest things we have to be thankful for. Are there any questions? Not even any comments? Well, that's good then, I guess. Ava, good to see you here today. Glad you made it. Will y'all be blessed? We'll be dismissed. And have a happy Thanksgiving and spend some time with your family. And whether you eat too much or not, at least enjoy the fellowship. Be with your family as, as in the years we have left before Christ returns. And before the tribulation comes, enjoy all the time you can with your family. Be blessed. We're dismissed.